All right. Well, everyone is uh, coming in. I always want to stick to my 801 time frame, which I will do today. And I want to welcome everyone again to Grand Rounds, and thank you for coming and spending this hour with us. So uh, this is the third in the series of the Dream Speaker series. And for those of you who were not here for the earlier ones, um, th these are speakers who are chosen by our chief residents uh, as someone who they emulate or an area of expertise that they're very interested in. And this Dream Speaker is uh, sponsored by Dr. Matt Brunner. And our dream speaker today is Dr. Stephen Goodman, MD, MHS, PhD. He is the professor and associate dean of clinical and translational research in the departments of epidemiology in Stanford. And the title of his talk today is How to Hack P-Values, a User's Guide. So I always tell you just a little bit about our, our, our speaker. Uh, at, for the Dream Speaker series, we're able to actually get to know our speakers a little bit more personally. We went to dinner last night, and one great thing we found out is that Dr. Uh, Goodman is actually an opera singer uh, who loves Gilbert and Sullivan and has performed with the Baltimore Opera, so I think that's fantastic. Um, so as far as uh, Dr. Goodman, in addition to his associate dean role, he's also the director of the CTSA training program in clinical and translational research at Stanford. He is the founder and co-director of Metrics, which is the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford. And in fact, Meta Research uh, is his love at this point in his career. He went to medical school at New York University of Medicine, followed by a pediatric residency at St. Louis Children's Hospital and an MHS at Johns Hopkins University followed by his PhD in epidemiology. Uh, just a couple highlights of what he's done over his career. I, I think from looking at this, he is probably the premier leader in this country in meta-research. He is currently a senior statistical editor at the Annals of Internal Medicine. He's the editor of clinical trials at the Journal of Society for Clinical Trials. And he's the vice chair of the Method Methodology Committee of Patient-Centered Outcomes at Bucori. I thought, uh, as far as honors, he was the president of St. Louis Physicians for Responsibility way back uh, in his early career. And most recently, he has been honored with the Spinoza Chair of Medicine from the University of Amsterdam and Spinoza Foundation. You know, I'm, I, I, I'm going to summarize how, uh, how important he is in the field of meta-research by saying you know, he just put the last uh, two years of his papers in his CV and in those papers, almost half were in these journals, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, JAMA, and the Annals of Internal Medicine. I think that speaks volumes. Uh, and so with that, uh, Dr. Goodman, we are really looking forward to your talk today. Thank you. Oh, it's on. Hi. And uh, thanks to those who came right on time. You, Grand rounds are usually a time for people to trickle in. Maybe they continue, <laughs> Will. So uh, thanks particularly to Matt for uh, having confidence to uh, uh, invite me. Uh, I, I would say you should, I, I hope you have better dreams than this, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I do appreciate being here. Uh, I, d I don't know if I'm going to live up to the dream of a uh, bar, but you know, I, I hope it's okay if I aim for not a nightmare. Is it, you know, and and then, then we're okay. So I, uh, I chose this topic because actually, amazingly, uh, you know, you can actually make a career not just of uh, generating p-values, but of studying uh, p-values. And, and of course, you don't just study p-values. What, what I like to study is what are the foundations of knowledge and what are the foundations of knowledge claims and how reliable is what we say on the basis of the research that we do. That's really what I study. Um, and so there you get how to hack p-values. Now I, I chose this uh, obviously a little tongue-in-cheek and hack has two uh, meanings. One is of course how do you uh, manipulate your research to get it to look good and uh, to get your p-values low. Uh, that's the one hack and the other is the you know sort of informal uh, use of you know how to understand them, how, how to use them. Um, so it's, it, we're going to talk a little bit about both. We're going to go pretty deep uh, it's not just going to be the traditional, you know, here's the, you know, where you use the, uh, you know, a given chi-square test or a logistic regression or whatever. We're going to look at the foundations of what these things mean. But And I want to start actually with an abstract and get your phones ready because we're going to follow this up with a poll everywhere poll. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so this is an actual uh, abstract 
from a uh, paper that appeared in Archives of Internal Medicine, and uh, it's an RCT uh, designed to improve uh, CCU um, uh, experience. Uh, and I have substituted for the intervention. I haven't shown you exactly, I will, uh, what the intervention is, and I'm calling it denosumab, uh, and here's the context. Denosumab has received little scientific attention. The positive findings of a previous controlled trial of denosumab have yet to be replicated, and the objective is to determine whether it improves uh, adverse events and, or lengths of stay in hospitalized cardiac patients. It's a RCT, um, it's in a private hospital. They randomized 1,990 patients. And what they found was that the denosumab group had a lower mean um, CCU course score, P of 0.04, by about 10%, 6.3 compared to about uh, 7.1. And uh, the length of stay was not different, but the actual intensity of the course was better. I'll show you what that score is. And the conclusion was denosumab would, was associated with lower CCU course scores. This result suggests this therapy may be an objective, effective adjunct to standard medical care. And what I'll tell you right now is that this is a therapy with a mechanism that a lot of people uh, believe very strongly in. And, uh, 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 you know, it, it, that, 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 they, that they think they understand. Um, this is the CCU core score. Uh, the, the mildest course would just be a need for antiangial agents, antibiotics, uh, arterial monitoring. Two is need for antiarrhythmics and inotropic diuretic or vasodilator support. Then three, need for a temporary pacemaker. Four, permanent pacemaker. Five, cardiac arrest. Six, death. So you don't want to go there. Um, and as you might remember, the, uh, the mean was around... Um, 2.3 versus 3.1, so hovering between uh, the need for the drugs and uh, need for a temporary pacemaker. So here's my question to you. We have a 1,000 uh, uh, subjects, in a, and I'll, I will submit that it's a good RCT. This is not a quiz saying it was a bad RCT. Uh, a 1,000 subjects randomized, a 10% increase, and the, here's the question. What is the probability that denosumab improves CCU patient outcomes? And, and I mean the score. So this is not a test of surrogate outcomes. Is this is the score and outcome? So you text Stephen Goodma, not Men, six one nine to two two three three, and put in your. Let's see if I can. Oops, sorry. Sorry, oops. I might have lost it there. Which let's see if it actually works. I don't think this is working. I don't think this is going to work because we're on presenter view. Let's see. No. Okay. I don't think it worked. That's too bad. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just ask for a show of hands. Um, no, it's because it's on presenter view. We're not going to do it. It's going to waste too much time. Thank, thank you, Clint. Um, so how many would say 95% um, or better? Almost nobody. 75 to 94, okay, about 20% uh, of you. 50 to 74, okay, a big chunk, less than 50%, uh, probably about 40%. Okay, so here it is. Now remember what your answer was, okay? So here is, and now I'm going to show you what it actually was. It was intercessory prayer. What is intercessory prayer? It was a group of folks who gathered in the hospital uh, lobby and prayed for the people who were in the CCU. The people in the CCU didn't know they were being prayed for, and the people who were praying didn't know who they were praying for. Uh, they were just assigned numbers or something. They just prayed really hard. Um, now, so let me do the same poll. Um, <laughs> Actually, that's not what I'm going to show you. So let me do the same poll. How many would have a 95% chance that the prayer is working to uh, improve the scores? Nobody. How many uh, 75 to 94%? Hmm. How many 50 to 74%? Oh, Betsy's brave. How many less than 50%? Wow, a little shift there. 
Who needs Paul everywhere? Got an honest Midwestern crowd. <laughs> I tell you, oh, everywhere I go, they look and see where the, the chief of medicines, you know, <laughs> hand goes, and then, <laughs> and they don't dare go uh, below. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so something changed there, right? Something changed in your assessment that had nothing to do with the numbers. So that's interesting. And probably, you know, I'm, I'm not arguing against it. It would change for me, too. So the, the, w one of the points that we'll be discussing is that we do not have a language for just what happened in the numbers. That is, the credibility of that result was totally different when I gave you an intervention that fundamentally you did not believe in the mechanism. And probably if I'd done homeopathy or something like that, you would have said something similar. So that tells you instantly that there's something that's not in the numbers that's actually really important and would possibly affect whether you would use an intervention. That's what we're going to explore. So we see claims all the time. And, you know, here we go. So Greek drinks, endometrial cancer, power of daily bout of exercise, oxytocin and autism. And we get articles like this. You know, this is my favorite medical journal, New York Times. So you see magnets lessen foot pain of diabetic, a study finds, and then you see right down here, a finding that runs counter to many previous studies. Now, that's exactly the kind of thing that might make them reluctant to publish this, but apparently that's what makes it newsworthy. Um, and this is directly from the article. Um, we have no idea how or why the magnets work, uh, but it's a real breakthrough. And while the study must be regarded as preliminary, the early results were clear and the treatment ought to be put to use immediately. Uh, and uh, in, in, in other talks, I've included shots of Dr. Scholes and CBS and, uh, and also a Cochrane review that showed that this did not work. Um, but again, I'm sure that this particular study it did have a P less than 0.05, and it was the basis for this claim. Now, lots of people have explored whether doctors um, uh, uh, understand statistics well. And actually, there's a whole series that goes back in the literature of, of people making their careers on showing that their residents don't know that much. And it's, I actually think it's a form of malpractice. It's just not fair. You know, we can't experiment on prisoners. We shouldn't be able to survey our own residents. And I'm not sure what this says about the people administering the survey. But anyway, this is, this is one of many of these articles. They appear about one every 10 years. It seems like we forget and then we, uh, we redo it. So this is a survey of Yale residents, 277 of them, uh, looking to see if they understand fundamental concepts. Um, actually, I, I, I have a story behind this. I'm, I'll, I'll, if I have time, I'll tell it later. Uh, so anyway, 277 Yale residents. Um, the average score was 41% on basic quantitative uh, uh, questions related to interpreting the literature that they read, probably in Journal Club. 95% of them felt it was important to understand these concepts to be an intelligent reader of the literature, so they didn't say it was irrelevant. And there was a question directly on p-values. I could talk about the whole survey. That could be a whole hour. And 59% of them got it right. But there was an irony here, which is that all of the multiple choice answers offered for the p-value question were wrong. So the survey itself could not, the people could not offer up the correct answer to what a p-value was. Uh, here's just one of many examples of, of things that can happen if we uh, interpret the literature in too black and white a way, and this is where we're going to be spending time here. And this is just randomly chosen. Actually, I, I gave a talk at a GU conference a, 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 about a month or two ago. I just literally, I always do this, I just picked up the most recent copy of their one of their top journals, and I just per turned to the first article. Uh, I did this actually for um, some basic scientists. I just went to, to show uh, how statistics were used or misused in the science literature. I just went straight to science. I opened up the first article, and there I was with uh, experiments with N, N of 3 um, and subsequent in, uh, misinterpretation. Anyway, here we had uh, intra, intraoperative cyst rupture during partial nephrectomy for cystal, cystic renal masses. Does it increase the risk of recurrence? The results, estimated recurrence-free survival did not differ significantly between patients with or without uh, intraoperative cyst rupture at 100% versus 92.7% at five years, but the P was only 0.2, so really not very significant. But if it was you and you saw that one procedure had 100% uh, recurrence-free survival at five years and the other had 93%, I don't know that you would be 
have equal poise about which intervention to take. And the text, the conclusion was, um, uh, keeping in mind the biases inherent in the retrospective study design and the possible lack of statistical power, uh, the cyst rupture had no negative impact on oncologic outcomes. Hmm. Would you say, just, you know, if you're talking to your mom or somebody, that it had no impact? I don't know that you'd say it had no impact. 100% survival, 93% survival, right? You might say, we're not that sure, imprecisely estimated. There's strong suggestion, but we don't know for sure, something like that. You would not say, you would not look at those numbers and say, it had no impact. So this is, again, part of what we'll talk about. This is actually a, a, an example of a case that generated a, a recent huge brouhaha, which I'll show you. Uh, these are two studies which had, um, I'm not even going to tell you what they're about because it's not important, uh, which showed uh, uh, hazard ratios of 1.2. Uh, one was, had a confidence interval, the, the one in the middle, from 0.97 to 1.48. The second one had a highly significant one with a, with a confidence interval going from 1.09 to 1.33. So you can see that the line on the left, uh, let's see, I have my little pointer. Yeah, so this is the line of no effect. This excludes no effect. This includes no effect. And, uh, you know, they add up to a yet more highly significant result. The, the reason that this letter was written was because in the paper where these were reported, this <coughs> was... Um, uh, reported as refuting the, the, uh, the finding here, that these two studies were in conflict. Would you say those two studies were in conflict? No, they're showing exactly the same effect. One confidence interval just includes one, one excludes one, but these are as consistent as you get. And this is how the current, uh, 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 the dominant mode of statistics um, sort of uh, twists our, the, our language and the way we think into saying things that, I, if we're shown the numbers, don't make that much sense. Now, this is occurring within a broader context where there's a lots of concerns about the reproducibility of medical research in, in general. This is just a part of it, we'll, but it, I'll allude to the other parts. So this is an article that got quite a lot of uh, attention uh, where um, it was out of Amgen where they tried to reproduce 53 landmark preclinical experiments that identified biomarkers, which would be the targets for, uh, for therapeutic, which would be therapeutic targets. And this was not just a matter of just taking the experiments as reported and, uh, you know, doing them once and seeing if they got the same result. This was completely different. They took every experiment. They tried to replicate it multiple times, sometimes in the lab of the original investigator with the same reagents, with the investigator directing the um, uh, the, the experiment and they couldn't do it. So this was an honest attempt to see if these targets upon which uh, pharma, you know, and, and other academics sometimes um, invest, you know, a lot of time and, and, and billions of dollars investing in, in further therapeutic development and they could only uh, reproduce this number. And actually this kind of finding has been rep reported by several others. So this uh, appeared in um, Nature a few years ago it was actually a survey of scientists, um, and, and this is the kind of thing that stirs up uh, the masses, actually reduces credibility of science, so it's, uh, it, it's a problem for us. Uh, here's a headline in The Economist, not good for us. This is a book by the NPR science reporter Richard Harris, and you see rigor mortis. He actually said he wanted to title it Science Friction, which would have been a much better title. <laughs> but his publisher forced him to say rigor mortis. I would not buy that book. Uh, but like the death of rigor, he says, how sloppy science creates, creates worthless cures, crushes hope, wastes billions. And the toe tag there is cause of death, biomedical research, place United States physicians too many. Not good for us, just not good. I would have preferred science fiction. And actually when you talk to him, the science, that, that is the theme, that this is not about the unreliability of science. It's the inefficiency, that we put a lot of resources in and we get less out than we should. That's a very different framing than rigor mortis. So uh, I was sorry he didn't win that. Uh, this was a result of the Nature Survey uh, of scientists. What factors could 
contribute to irreproducible research on what could boost reproducibility. And uh, I'll just focus on the what could boost reproducibility. Number one, better understanding of statistics. Great, so that's why I'm here. Um, better mentoring supervision, more robust design, better teaching, so uh, incentives for better practice. There are lots of things there. Um, we're going to talk that, about that more. There's also recently been a statement of the uh, uh, American uh, Statistical Association, the first statement in its 125-year history. This is not an association. It's not like uh, you know some lobbying organization that goes around just saying things blithely. Never made a statement. So upset that the world uh, was misinterpreting PBIs that they put out a statement on it. We're going to rediscover that. And just a few weeks ago, 800 scientists signed up to a statement that's appeared in Nature saying we should get rid of statistical significance entirely. Okay, so how could this be happening? You, you probably, not all of you probably feel comfortable even choosing a statistical test for, uh, for a study or understand what you're reading when you read it. Um, and uh, here we are with statisticians saying let's dump the whole thing. So how did we get here? So I'm going to just give you a little bit of history, p-values, the prequel. How did we get here? So you've seen Star Wars. Now let's go back and figure out where Harrison Ford came from and all that. Uh, so uh, part of it is due to this guy. Actually, I'm going to show you that he's blameless. Who knows who this is? Anybody under 30 know who this is? Fisher. I hear good rumblings from over here. Yeah, so this is R.A. Fisher. R.A. Fisher, I didn't expect many people to know who he was. I did think a few. He's really one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century. He should be up there with Einstein and Fermi and you name it. And I'm not kidding. What, you have no idea how many ideas he, he coined and generated that are the, the firmament of science today. This is him looking like a whippersnapper in his school days. This is him looking much more confident when he started publishing the books and, and ideas that he published. He was not only one of the greatest statisticians ever, um, really created the field. Uh, he, he was one of the greatest uh, 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 geneticists and, and biologists. So he created the, all, basically the whole framework for modern statistical analysis. He created all these words, not just the concepts, uh, sig the word significance, p-values, ANOVA, meta-analysis, created them all. Population genetics and evolutionary theory. He, he mathematized the whole thing. He's the founder of, of modern population mathematical genetics. Experimental design. He was the one who developed the theory of randomization. He was the one who developed the scientific approaches to agricultural research and how to breed um, um, more productive plants. He wrote three of the, the, the most popular scientific books of the 20th century, Statistical Methods for Research Workers, which was a handbook, the first ever, and it was a bestseller from the 20s to the 60s. The Genetic Theory of Mat Natural Selection, which was the first formal mathematical treatment of genetics and the design of experiments, the first book ever written on how to design experiments that was written in the 30s. So, and this is only a fraction of what he did. Interestingly, he never had a post in statistics. This is when he, uh, in his older days, he was cantankerous. So let me talk about um, some of the, um, I want to make sure we, yeah, the time. Uh, with the problem he confronted. So I'm going to use medical inference as, uh, as the paradigm. So as we know, uh, you know, you have uh, the textbooks are full of the symptoms of various diseases. So we have illness A, and it's associated with a cough and a rash and splenomegaly. Illness B, and it's associated with a cough, fever, rash, and angina. Illness C, uh, fever, angina, and splenomegaly. So this is what we teach medical students, and medical students become essentially walking textbooks. Um, and if they don't become walking textbooks, if they have, you know, they, they have uh, up-to-date in their pocket, uh, they, they are essentially walking uh, databases. Um, but that's not what medicine is. It is not about being told what somebody has and listing the possible symptoms. Um, and going, I just want to say, going from the illness to the possible symptoms is the deductive direction, and that's the easy part. The hard part is being a doctor which it was a shock to me when I got to my third year and they said, you know, go look at the lady in room four. And the lady in room four did not have, uh, you know, uh, uh, possible stroke written on her. She didn't have stroke written on her forehead. She had, you know, a set of symptoms. She had weakness. She had headache, whatever. And you have to go in the opposite direction. That's the inductive direction, and that is hard. 
That's hard. It's hard in medicine, and it's hard in statistics. So they were confronting the same thing. There is this, uh, there is a mathematical theory that links knowing, if you know the truth, what's the probability that you'll see various truths? And that's easy. That is math. It's hard to go in the other direction, the inductive direction. Given the data that you see, what is the possible truth? And at the time, there was a technology to do that of sorts that was used called Bayes' theorem, and we'll talk more about that. But they were trying to create a completely objective method of inference, one that just involved formulas and didn't involve in injection of any other factors like the factor you just practiced in the very first example. Something outside the numbers. What you, the reason you answered differently, there was something outside the numbers. But they wanted to create a method that was, had nothing outside the numbers. So what happens uh, when you do that? Well, you, you develop a system that has some of the same issues that we showed in the first uh, three minutes of this lecture. So what if, let's start with um, what do you think the actual meaning, uh, where p-value came from? Is it probability? Is it plausibility? Is it possibility? Anybody know where p, what the p and p-value stands for? That's, of course, it's publish. <laughs> <laughs> so technically, it actually was called originally an associated probability. So let's just define it. And I'm not going to tell you that it tells you its meaning. This is the definition. There's a difference between definition and meaning. Is the probability of getting a result as or more extreme than the observed result if the null hypothesis of chance were true? So it's going from the hypothesis to the data. It was originally intended to be a measure of evidence used in combination with other information to interpret individual experiments. And this is how Fisher described it. A rational and well-defined measure of reluctance to accept the hypotheses they test. Look at that. That's really interesting. It's a measure of reluctance. It's not a probability. It's a measure of reluctance. He was a, a real hermeneut, if you know what that word is. He paid attention to the meaning of words. Reading his text is, for some people, maddening. But it's like reading the Bible. Every word has tremendous meaning. There's a reason why he chose this. Because he knew it did not mean it is the credibility of the hypothesis. He knew it wasn't the actual confidence. Those words were hijacked by later scientists. So to create a picture, it's if the null this is the distribution of possible results on the null hypothesis. This is what you saw. The p-value is the area to the right. This is what he said. If 1 in 20 does not seem high enough odds, that's the 0.05 level, we may, if we prefer, draw the line at 1 in 50, 2%, or 1 in 100, 1%. Personally, the writer himself prefers to set a low standard of significance, by which he means a low standard of evidence, a weak, a weak standard, uh, at the 5% point and ignore entirely all results which fail to reach this level. A scientific fact should be regarded as experimentally established only if a properly designed experiment rarely fails to give this level of significance. This is maybe the most important sentence in the early development, completely ignored today. So what did significance mean? He was doing large agricultural experiments, and he'd have you know, hundreds of plots of land, and it was which plot just should you notice? It's literally notice, but not believe. It was, what you do is you notice that, you apply the same treatment, perhaps again and again and again, and if that plot continues to yield more, then you believe it. Remember, if it, a properly designed experiment rarely fails to give this level of significance. So, he, in a sense, he's describing meta-analysis. Five clinical trials with a positive result. Ten. That's what he meant. He did not mean you stop and you plant your flag and you publish in the New England Journal. That is not what he meant. Because he knew what it meant. So what is the p-value not? It's not the probability of the null hypothesis. It's not the probability that you'll make a type 1 error uh, if you reject the null hypothesis. It's not the probability that the observed uh, data occurred by chance. It's not the probability of the observed data under the null hypothesis, because it's observed data plus more extreme, which makes a huge difference. I will tell you it's not almost anything that makes sense to you. If you actually want to know what's the confidence I have in this finding, you can't transmute the p-value into that. 
which is why, in many ways, we're in the situation we are today. And here's an example of a discussion at the FDA just to show how confusing they can be. This is discussing the approval of Carvedilol, which is a, a cardiac drug which uh, was designed to improve uh, heart failure. They, that's how they designed the, the, the um, trial. But unfortunately, what happened, and they did that because they didn't think they would have the power to show that improved mortality. Um, but it, what happened, strangely, was that it didn't affect measures of heart failure at all, but it had a huge effect on mortality. Oops. So this is what they said. We have to wrestle, what we have to wrestle with, he's head of the, the advisory committee, is how to interpret p-values for secondary endpoints in a trial which uh, was negative for the primary. Uh, in a trial with a positive endpoint, you haven't spent all the alpha on that primary endpoint, and you have some alpha to spend on the secondary endpoints. In a trial with a negative finding for the primary, you have no more alpha to spend for the secondary endpoints. And then two cardiologists go at it. What are the p-values needed for the secondary endpoints? Certainly we're not talking 0.05 anymore. You're out of this 0.05 stuff. I would have liked to have seen what was significant at what level. What p-value tells you it's there, study after study? What kind of statistical correction would you have to do to the survival data given the fact it's not a specified endpoint? I have no idea how to do that from a mathematical endpoint. So, viewpoint. So, the point here is cardiologists shouldn't be talking about this. I mean, this is, this is almost nonsense. They should be talking about cardiology. And they should talk about, you know, what are the surrogate endpoints? Does this make sense? How do we put this together? They can be allied there with statisticians that can help them sort this out. But this shows, again, how the, the framework really cuts us off from what we know as physicians, as biologists. And that's very dangerous. We don't have a language to talk quantitatively about how what we know unites with the numbers. Now, I only showed you a little bit about uh, Fisher. There were these other people that came onto the scene, Naaman and Pearson. They created something that you probably didn't know was any different. It was called hypothesis testing. They introduced these words, uh, alternative hypothesis, error rates, and power. That was not part of the original conception. Uh, they proposed that we plan experiments with a, with a, a type 1 error and a, a given power. You either rejected the null and it, well, accepted the alternative, or you um, accepted the null and rejected the alternative. And this is critical. It was designed as decision rules under repeated use with no rule for inference in an individual study. This was absolutely critical. They said it explicitly. This is, we do not use this for deciding in any particular case whether something is true or not. Uh, and they didn't use p-values. This is what Fisher had to say about that. Now, these days, uh, these two methods are conflated. But he went crazy when he saw this. And, and this is what he wrote. No scientific worker has a fixed level of significance, that is P of 0.05. From year to year, in all circumstances, he rejects hypothesis. He examines each particular case in light of the evidence and, 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 and ideas. The concept that a scientific worker can res regard himself or herself as an inert item in a vast cooperative concern, working uh, according to accepted rules, is encouraged by directing attention away from his duty to uh, form corrective, correct scientific conclusions, and by stressing his supposed duty to mechanically make a succession of automatic, quote, decisions, uh, the idea that this uh, responsibility can be delegated to a giant computer programmed with decision functions, that's the hypothesis test, belongs to a fantasy of circles rather remote from scientific research. So what he's describing is SAS. Um, <laughs> so he was really upset by this, that his contribution was absorbed into this other framework of sort of automatically stamping out scientific conclusions of P of 0.05. That's what he was upset about. Um, he was basically, it's captured in this gra graphic, conclusions are not false or true, but they're uncertain from, you know, from zero to 100 percent, and it's affected by other studies, quality of design, quality of execution, strength of findings, biologic evidence, and other things. That's the model of science that he was promoting. What we have today is a very weird hybrid that's a mix of these two approaches, where we plan the experiment with pre-specified type 1 type 2 errors, 5% and more than 80% power. That's from Naaman and Pearson. Almost always use 5% for type 1 error and more than 80% power. Nobody suggested that. Calculate a p-value at the end of the experiment. That's pure Fisher. It's not the other. Uh, if the result is significant, reject the null hypothesis, name it in Pearson. If the result is non-significant, the verdict, we tend to say now it's not proven. Uh, that's Fisher. And don't use outside information interpretation. That's name it in Pearson. What's particularly weird about this is not only is it a it's sort of bizarre amalgam of two actually incompatible theories, 
but they're not taught in the books as theories. We have theory of relativity. We have Schrodinger. You know, we have uh, what the uncertainty uh, principle. We have all the. We have theory. We even have Darwin's theory of evolution. But when you're taught statistics, you are not taught Fisherian theory, Neiman Pearson theory, Bayesian theory. Bayesian actually sometimes you do hear that, but you're not taught that these are just pr philosophic stance, and that these can be contested. These are not. This is not mathematics. It's philosophy. And that's a big problem for how we learn things. And that is why uh, the ASA uh, in 2016 made this statement. And look what their statement was. Um, P-values don't measure the probability of the studied hypothesis is true. Scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions shouldn't be based on whether a p-value only passes a specific threshold. A p-value or statistical segments does not measure the size and effect of the importance of the result. And they elaborate on that. Practices that reduce data analysis or scientific inference to mechanical bright line rules, such as P of less than 0.05 for justifying scientific claims or conclusions, can lead to erroneous beliefs and poor decision making. A conclusion does not immediately become true on one side and false on the other. Research should bring many other things in, into play in the study. And using P of 0.05 as a license for making a claim of a scientific finding or truth leads to continue, considerable distortion of the scientific process. So what did they say there? Exactly what Fisher said in 1956. It's no different. And in fact, the methods we use are barely different. What's interesting about this is that there was a group of about 25 of us who put this together, and there were 21 quasi-dissents published along with the statement. So this shows, shows that this is very live. That actually doesn't compare to this, which is this, this recent declaration I just told you that we should abandon statistical significance, because this was simultaneously appeared in the, uh, the journal, the American Statistician, with 41 papers with uh, statisticians saying uh, how they have a different take on things. And actually a lot of them commenting on how you should think. It really is, it, it's, a, it's a contest for the minds, hearts and minds of scientists. And statisticians actually have the illusion that they have some control over that. I wrote a paper saying you have absolutely no control over how most scientists think. They, this, is, this is out of the barn. and You've got to start working within communities of, of ecologists and doctors and, and economists if you're going to change this. So there is an alternative, which is Bayesian theory. And I'm just going to just touch on it a little bit. Um, so what is Bayes' theorem? And this is a very simple schematic. It says that the odds that the odds that a hypothesis is true is a combination of two things. The odds that it was true before you started, which again was reflected in the first example. You had pretty strong feelings about whether prayer would work or not, times evidence from the experiment, which is captured in something called the Bayes factor, which is nothing more complicated than just saying how likely is this finding under one hypothesis compared to how likely it is under another. And for those of you who have studied diagnostic logic, it's just the likelihood ratio uh, that you get when you look at um, a diagnostic test. Um, so here's a conceptual framework for analyzing research. And there's actually a lot packed into the slide, but I won't spend too much time. First, there's the evidence, which is simply what the data say. Then, what does the evidence do? It moves your degree of belief by a fixed amount. But where you end up, which I have here, so this might be the, the strength of, whoa, ah, 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 boy, all the punchlines. <laughs> this might be from the study, but where you started, the degree of belief you had in prayer was here. And so where you end up depends on two things, where you started and how strong it is from the study. Then what you do depends on your belief and the consequences of the actions. So if, if, if the consequence of a false negative is very, very, very dire, then you don't want to make many false negative conclusions. You may set the bar, which whatever it is, very, very high or very, very low to avoid that. Uh, so what does a p-value actually mean? For, from a Bayesian perspective, and I can't describe exactly how I got here, if you start with, so this is a P of 0.05, a 10% prior probability, a pretty unlikely hypothesis, it moves you up, it, and this is assuming ideal experimentation, like an RCT, okay? A well done, to 21 to 43%, and I'm not gonna explain why that's a little bit fuzzy. If you start at 25%, it moves you up to just under 50% to about 70%. 
If you start 50-50, P of 0.05 gets you maybe to 70% to almost 90%. So that's the way I think of them. And that's at best. Then you start the discounting based on the conduct and everything else. P of 0.01, similar except it brings you farther. Now this assumes everything is done perfectly. But things are not always done perfectly. Anybody know who this fellow is? This is a very famous, actually, uh, and he's been made more now infamous, Brian Wansink. He's a, he's a nutrition researcher from Cornell. He is the source of an enormous, enormous amount of, of uh, factoids about nutrition. Uh, things like if you uh, lower the, you know, uh, serve it on smaller plates, people will take less and they will eat less and they will lose more weight. Or if you have the half price buffet, people will take more and they will gain weight. Lots and lots of things. And he got in a lot of trouble. This is the slicing and dicing of a pizza. Uh, and this is the headline below that, how a Cornell scientist, Brian Wansink, turned shoddy data into viral studies about how we eat. And this is really going to be the instruction on how to hack p-values. This is actually, I'm going to read it to you because you can't read it. A letter he wrote to one of his graduate students who was visiting a woman who was visiting for a year. And let me, I'll have to turn around to read this. He says, uh, glad you had a chance to take an initial look at the data. I don't think I've ever done an interesting study where the data, quote, came out the first time I looked at it. The interesting stories came from seeing when things like the half price buffet works and when it doesn't. I want you to really dig into this. I'm going to skip. He says, there, think of all the ways you can cut the data and analyze subsets of it to see when this relationship holds. The main analysis was negative, I will tell you. For instance, if it works on men but not women, we have a moderator. Here's some groups you might want to break out separately. Males, females, lunchgoers, dinnergoers, people sitting alone, people eating with groups of two, people eating in groups of two plus, people who order alcohol, people who order soft drinks, people who sit close to the buffet, people who sit far away, and so on. And then for outcomes, you can look at the number of pieces of pizza they take, or the number of trips, or the fill level of the plate, or did they get dessert, or did they order a drink, and so on. He finally says, this is really important to try and find as many things here as possible before you come. It will make a good impression on people and help you stand out. Second, it will be the highest likelihood of getting something publishable out of your visit. Work hard, squeeze some blood out of this rock, and we'll see you soon. Okay. There were a lot of, I want to tell you, this was followed up by seven papers in major nutritional journals based on these analyses. He actually described this in his own blog post, in his own blog. And that's how it was caught, because he didn't realize, he said, that it was wrong. So this is what's happening, maybe not quite as egregiously and maybe not as quite as out in the open, but this is the kind of practices, I will say somewhat watered down, uh, that, that's going on that, that is affecting the reproducibility of science. And we do it in subtle ways. We don't do it in as egregious ways as that. I will say, by the way, that if you did what he said, it's perfectly okay. You just have to say what you did. My answer to almost everything is just say what you did. If, you're, if, you're, if you do all those things, you say, I did all these things. I looked at people sitting far away. I looked at this. I looked at this. I looked at this. I looked at this. And then I found that. But that's not what we say. We say, I looked at this, and you don't see the others. So there are lots and lots of ways that we do it. Actually just fitting models in many, many different ways. Is, is, is a way to shrink wrap your data. Reliance on single studies to establish major, major claims. Selective reporting of experiments that work. Failure to account adequately for massive multiplicity in experiments. Poor reporting and handling of missing data. And this is augmented by lots of incentives outside the strong publication, higher tier uh, journals. Um, and we're taught to use significance verdicts. Uh, so. I could go, this could, you know, this could be many, many slides, but the point is that these practices, the, 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 the p-value issue is just embedded within a much larger context that is uh, weakening science. This is a, a piece I published in Nature just uh, a few months ago, and it simply said at the end of the day, at the end of the article, just put a degree of confidence that you have in the result. Let's forget the p-values, forget everything. Just say, how confident are you in this claim? I w I'm... I have to say I'm embarrassed by it because this should not be publishable. This should not be publishable. What? Just say your degree of confidence, yet it's been trained out of us to say, because this number is not in the traditional numbers we use. That's the problem. It's not there. 
and we've lost touch with our ability to even say it out loud. And of course, when you say it, it sounds non-scientific, but if we started doing it, we could start calibrating things, and then this would become more scientific. Interesting, betting markets do very well. If you have scientists, in a sense, poll, like I polled you at the beginning, that was the, the example of a prediction market. And if I had asked you to bet, you almost certainly would have been right about that study on the odds that it was true. So that was an example of how collective wisdom actually can capture the proper degree of confidence. Lots and lots of articles uh, related to this. This is Annals, came out very, very early in 2007. This is Science, just in 2018, Science Under Scrutiny. Uh, Francis Collins actually wrote an article in 2014 talking about all the ways that NIH plans to enhance reproducibility. I would say they still haven't quite figured it out. Um, here's uh, just from last year, uh, greater reproducibility for life science research and nature. Actually, interesting, nature and science just added statistical editors a few years ago, which is routine in the top clinical journals. They're, they're just discovering that actually proper use of statistics is, is important. Um, uh, this report came out of the National Academy. It's really, really interesting. For the first time, they incorporated, so traditional research integrity measures, uh, 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 violations are FFP, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. For the first time, they said that what should, that we should wrap in improper research practices into research integrity, including many of the things that I talked about here. And that's a big deal because it's also allied with this call just from Marsha McNutt, head of now, uh, then previously uh, editor of science, now head of the National Academies, just wrote this piece about two months ago saying we should have a U.S. advisory board for research integrity. And I'm telling you, this is probably coming. This is probably coming. So that is the context in which um, these sorts of calls are being made. I would say we don't have a perfect methodologic solution to this. Uh, and actually, in, to just reinforce how au courant this is, I just got this in my email yesterday. There is going to be a published release uh, webinar on May 7th, just uh, early next week, on the release of a report from the National Academies on Reproducibility and Repli Repli Replicability in Science. It was a, it was a committee uh, convened by Harvey Feinberg, uh, who is the former president of the National Academies, and he chaired this committee. Pretty big deal. So I think I will stop there, uh, partly because science says I should, because it tells me that lectures aren't just boring, they're ineffective. Uh, <laughs> but fortunately, there's some other studies uh, that say that uh, those studies are wrong. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. <laughs> And express your degree of confidence, please, with your question. <laughs> okay, so we have one here and then one in the back. Uh, that was great. Yeah, I was not <laughs> not so much nature and science, but anyway, yes. up there. <laughs> How much time do we have? Let's see. Uh, five. I, wanna, I want the person in the back to ask his question. I'll just answer in two, three minutes. First of all, only the very top journals have the resources to have statisticians. That's A. So you're talking about one, you know, talking about the upper, not even the 1%. It's the 0.2%. They cost money. And I actually have done research on how many journals use them. Only the very top. Two, they cannot police what they can't see. So one of the issues here is that people don't say everything they did. So that list of analysis, as I said, if people just said, well, oh, I looked at 4,000 different models and I chose this, then you know how to do it. You, 
you cannot um, you, you can't police what you can't see and people don't routinely report data at the procedures completely enough they don't know to do it they may not even realize that what they're doing is uh, it, it, that, that they're sort of committing sort of inferential crimes when they do it and that's overstating things uh, uh, the things that affect the, the strength of the inference. And, and the other thing is that the they can't be the police. They do not. I mean, even the, those, I work as one of these statisticians. We can't go with the original data set and try to replicate the analyses. I mean, that's what you're talking about. The journals are a very, very, very weak barrier. They take the data that's presented. They, they look at the procedures. They does this reasonably match up. We do a huge amount. I mean, you wouldn't believe how much time we probably invest on the order of 20 to 30 hours of editorial time in every paper that we publish at the annals, at least. Um, but we don't remotely go below the surface to do the sort of policing that you're talking about. That actually has to be done uh, in the institutions in, in various ways, by colleagues, by just having practices, uh, research practices that involve double checking and, and, and reproducibility checks and audits and things like this without imposing too much of a superstructure that you know, strangles science and makes it no longer fun. But these should be part of standard practice. Right now, what's incentivized and what is accepted as part of standard practice is not a self-correcting or self-policing mechanism, or I should say, it's a weak one. I mean, we, we're all in the same, we're all aiming for the same thing. We actually don't want to publish things that aren't true. Nobody wants to do that. But unfortunately, their incentives also very strongly to publish things, and the, the, the truth is very slow to catch up. So you're not, you're not penalized or disincentivized from publish something that has an overstated claim that in three years we realize, or five years or seven years, wasn't true at all. It's, this is a very complicated phenomenon, and, and you bring up excellent points. There are multiple checkpoints. The entire system has to work right. The entire system has to work right. I will, I'll just point out, you didn't mention this, but the, the, the NIH itself did not know that approximately 50, per, this is at the NHLBI, 50 percent of the studies it was uh, um, uh, supporting were not being published at five years. The most basic accounting were being essentially thrown in the garbage. They didn't know that. So there was no disincentive not to publish. I mean, how, and, and they never asked anybody. They didn't check when they were funding them again. Did you publish? Uh, did you publish a paper with the last, you know, seven hundred thousand dollars I gave you? I mean, that's the context that we're working in. So when people can throw results in the garbage after they get hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, and we're talking about the the statisticians at the journals checking things, we have a very complex system, and it, the whole thing needs to be reformed. Which is why I said the Scientific Integrity Board is coming. The, the, all the players have to change, and each one is restrained by the others. Everyone is, you know, if the funders don't move, if the journals don't move, if promotion incentives are stay the same within academic medical centers, all the and all these things work in concert. So there is a cultural change that's happening now. What's going to happen is the whole boat is slowly turning, and then all of a sudden it's going to look like something happened overnight. And but it will be ten or fifteen years in in the making, and we're already well into that. I'd say we're about seven years into that revolution. It might accelerate faster. So that's the longish answer to an even longer uh, possible response. But you, thank you for that. Yes? I'm sorry, an NIH reviewer or a journal reviewer? Which? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I actually study peer review. Uh, so all I'll say is you're right. It's an imperfect system. It is imperfect. There are many, depending on what kind of review you're talking about, whether it's NIH or journal review, um, the, the remedies are somewhat different. There is, a, there is a misconception that reviewers actually determine the results of a fate of, of articles in, in journals. In the top journals, they are advisory to the editors. I look much more to the editors. The editors can recognize a stupid review 
or a contentless review or to some extent somebody with an ax to grind. So not always, but at the top journals, the, the reviewers are advisory. They are not determinate. At lesser journals, they tend to be determinate because the, the editors are not they're, – they're basically not paid. They're academics who run journals out of their hip pocket, which I did that for with, with one small journal. I know exactly what it's like. And you're, you're, you don't have to, the kind of time that you would otherwise. I would say we have to do better, uh, but – like democracy, the, the question is, what, what are the alternatives? Um, we have to take this. I, I don't know of a, an actual alternative to peer review. Uh, but we have to, there are many, many, many things we could do that would improve the quality of peer review. And we need to acknowledge some of the randomness in peer review. There have been some very radical proposals about funding, not, not, that far different than issues around uh, college admissions, where the things that, that where uh, proposals that had absolutely the highest rankings got funded, uh, and then those who got actually terrible uh, ratings would not get funded, but there would be a lottery in the middle, uh, because in fact the system has been shown to be basically a lottery right now, because of a lot of the randomness that you have talked about. That's that's for funding decisions. Um, and that would uh, keep certain ideas or certain people from being systematically shut out of the system. I think, I think we need more and better peer review and statistical review at journals. Uh, they can't do everything, though, and the pool of statisticians to do this, which is really service work for an, another profession. Everybody says to me, the first thing is, why do statisticians have to be paid? I say, they don't have to be paid to review for statistical journals. But you're saying they have to be on tap for cardiology, hematology, neurology, urology, and let's just start listing all the, all the specialties. There's not enough in the world. And it's not just statisticians. It's epidemiologists. It's people who are sort of trained to marry numbers and, um, and, 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 and substantive science. Uh, but not all the problems are just in the numbers. I mean, a lot of the problems are in experimental procedure, lots of things that are completely under the control of people even who are not expert analysts. So I don't have a simple closed form uh, um, answer for you. I, I do, the NIH is looking, has been trying a lot of different models uh, for NIH review. Uh, the uh, journals, I think the better we are, they are a reflection of us. They are us. And the better trained we are, the better the journals will be. So it's it really on us to be, do the training and to train ourselves to be the best peer reviewers we can be. Um, and that's uh, as much as I can say there. Yes, we have two. Uh, well, there are a lot of really superb journals from other countries. I think what's happening now, it, sometimes you don't even know where the articles are coming from now because they just wh whiz around the Internet. And one of the biggest problems, and actually this is a, uh, the, the dark side of open access, is that we have these predatory journals. Basically, anything can be published out there, and you have no idea what process it's been through. And uh, and we have journals coming in that are just uh, mills for getting uh, publication fees. That, to me, is a bigger issue. There, some of the, the many uh, foreign journals, foreign outside of the U.S., are superb journals. Um, but to know which ones are the best ones. It's as problematic as knowing which of the U.S. you know U.S. based um, scientific knowledge now doesn't know borders anymore um, with the internet. It's a it's a it's a completely brave new world, and I would say I cannot predict what scientific publishing is going to look like in ten years. Could we have possibly known fifteen years ago what we have today? I don't know, and so I I think. More than U.S. versus non-U.S. based, we ha we're going to have to figure out what to do with the welter of information that's going to be spinning around the Internet and landing in our patients' laps um, without any known filtration uh, going forward. That That's going to be the real challenge uh, for the next generation. One last question and then up to the front. Yeah. So somehow, perhaps as a species, we're susceptible. <laughs> Oh, 
uh, I'm sorry, what has been allowed to occur? So we don't have much time. I will simply say that the the actual introduction, this is a, a big subject, of, of statistics into medicine was introduced to put some sort of a methodologic barrier between uh, our our desire to believe what we want to believe and, and real science. That That is, the statistics are best viewed as a social technology, almost less than an inferential technology. They're a way to keep uh, from spurious claims and spurious things from, from you know, filling the marketplace. Um, and that's what it's there for. It's to, in a sense, protect us from ourselves. Um, but it's not perfect. It's not remotely perfect. And in the end, we still need what doctors have to offer in terms of knowledge of their patients and knowledge of disease processes to unite with those numbers. Uh, and, and maybe we've gone too far in, in letting the numbers make decisions for us. So what the exact right balance is between what the doctor brings to the table and what the research brings to the table, I think that's what is going to be adjudicated going forward because we clearly have a system, as has been seen by the various protests I talked about, where one set of rules is substituting for another, maybe to excess, and even, interesting, the statisticians are the ones who are, who are uh, sounding the alarm, which is very, very interesting. So I don't know if that exactly addressed your question, but I guess we'll have to leave it there, but I'm happy to talk more.